Well, welcome to Mining Now, a film from CIM Montreal 2023, or two, 2023, and it's a busy convention, that's for sure. And I'm your host, Roy Slack, and for this, this episode, we're featuring Hecla. And joining us is Phil Baker, none other than the, the CEO of Hecla. And uh, I'm going to throw something in right at the start. Uh, Hecla has been in operation over 130 years, a little bit longer than CIM. Yeah. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Hecla for all the support. Uh, the company supports CIM, supports SME, the industry, and also to you personally. Because it isn't just the company, but your time, and you've presented at a number of these. And so I just want to plug that in at the start. Thank you very well, much. Well, I, I know we get more out of it than we put in. It, it's a great organization, CIM, SME, you know, uh, PDAC, um, you know, all of those organizations we are, we are part of because it really is critical for us to learn and to also share what share. we know, you know. Yeah. So we're, we're going to do some sharing today. Okay. Glad <laughs> to do it. So uh, I want to start out with, with the mine where it all began, the mine I know most about of your operations, and, and that's, that's Lucky Friday. And it's been around a long time, but what I find interesting is it's a uh, hotbed of innovation. Absolutely, and and it has been for a long time. Um, yeah, the mine started in I think 1942, so we're in the 81st year of of that mine, and uh, it, it, there's been a series of of innovations that have taken place. And the, you know, we had a mining method that was developed in the 80s um, called the Luffel method, the Lucky Friday underhand long wall, <laughs> yeah. and uh, that method has served Hecla really well. Um, for the, you know, really, uh, you know, since 1987. Um, but what we found in starting in about 2015 is, and, and this is sort of at the time that the shaft was mm -hmm. was being constructed, was the, uh, was the seismicity was increasing. And it was something we were having to deal with. And so as a result of that seismicity, we ended up having our stope shut down about 25% of the time. And so really, really hard to have a, an economic ore body with that sort of, uh, sort of interruption in production. Let's talk about our heavy industry tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide and Corporate Traveler Canada, helping companies travel the globe simpler, faster, and easier. We are heading to events across North America, Africa, and Australia and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at crownsman.com to be part of Crownsman's heavy industry world tour. Okay, so let's give a special thank you to one of our longest sponsors of the show, Savannah Equipment. And I'm actually going to hand it over to Jared so that he can give you a little bit more info on Savannah Equipment. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's Yeah, so I mean, people see them as sponsors, so they'll ask me, you know, kind of who they are, what they are, and just trying to understand the scope of the company. So Savannah Equipment is a mining supply company. And they're delivering on the whole equipment supply chain. So everything from the ore processing to underground mining, open pit, they're in hard rock and placer operations. And what they're doing is they're sourcing equipment from all over the world and then delivering it all over the world. Now, they are a Canadian company, so they're based there. But, you know, let's say, I mean, they're selling entire ore processing plants. So there might be a plant down in Latin America and there's a new mine that needs that plant in Africa or somewhere in the US. So they're facilitating that entire transaction. But they're also delivering, you know, an individual conveyor or a concentrator or a pump package or just a, an electrical package. So it really is the whole gambit of the mining equipment supply chain. Oh, well, that's great then. Well, then you definitely have to check them out if you're looking for mining equipment. Visit them at SavannahEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. Created and designed by industry leaders with decades of frontline experience, Sophie is a platform that brings workers home every day. Give your workforce the communication tools they need on the job to do it safely and productively. Visit Sophie.com today to discover how you can leverage Sophie to increase efficiencies, mitigate risk, and optimize collaboration. Safer, smarter, Sophie. With Fender Dunlop, you know you are getting the best conveyor belting in the market. That's because they ensure the integrity of their conveyor belting by monitoring each step of the manufacturing process in their North American facilities. Focused attention is given to each belting order to guarantee that they produce a belt that will assist the customer in reducing operation costs, maximizing uptime, and improving revenue. 
Visit FennerDunlopAmericas.com to learn more. And, well, you talk about seismicity, and I'm not sure if our audience knows just how deep Lucky Fred yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, you know the, so, so for the audience, let me just say, <laughs> Roy, you, you, know, you were part of cementation, and cementation um, built that shaft, and that shaft goes almost two miles below the surface. So mm-hmm. not quite the deepest mine in North America, but certainly the deepest in the U.S. Deepest, and, yeah. and among the deepest in, uh, in North America. And there's not many mines that are two miles below the surface. Um, and we made that investment because you have such a big ore body that sits there. You know, it's a, it's between the reserves and resources. You've got hundreds of millions of ounces of silver plus lead and zinc, and uh, it's a, on a sort of a linear, sort of ore body, almost completely vertical. And so it's a really, really interesting place to to operate, and it's part of the reason why it's been around for such a long time. But as it gets deeper. You, you have to innovate, right? Absol- you, you absolutely. You can't leave it behind, and, and so you've come up with some interesting things. We, we have. Um, so what we found was that, that with the stopes having to be shut down, um, we, we couldn't get this level of production that we needed to have the productivity. And if we didn't shut the stopes down for periods of time when we had these indications that we were going to have a seismic event, we, and we didn't know exactly when those events would happen, um, we ran a risk of of injury, and so we just were not willing to take that that risk. So we said we got to figure out how to how to to change the mine. So we started looking at mechanical mining. That was the path that we went on was to say, okay, instead of putting this energy in the rock through blasting, what we'll do is put very little energy in by just cutting the rock. And and so we built this machine with Epi Rock machine it is is completely built, was ready to go. Uh, and then a couple of things happened. One was we had a strike at the Lucky Friday, um, and that was during the course of this thing being built. Um, that strike uh, slowed things down, but it gave us an opportunity to really study, study things. Um, and then you had COVID. And as a result of COVID, we said, okay, we can't bring, we, we in fact can't even go see the machine. Yeah. We couldn't do the travel necessary. And so as a result of that, we um, started looking at preconditioning the rock okay. before yeah. we were going to cut it. And the reason for that was we wanted to make sure the slip faults that are in the, in the ore body would not b- basically bury the machine. So, so, and it was, a, the machine was going to be operated completely remotely so that we wouldn't have the risk of, of, of a, a miner being in the, uh, in the harm's way. So in that process of, of preconditioning the rock, we actually developed a whole new mining method that's a drill and blast method, which um, has an advantage over the mechanical mining in that we don't have a single point of failure. So with the mechanical mining, if that machine breaks down or yeah. something happens, you know, you're, you're, you're dead. Stopped, yeah. so, so we went to, we, we started doing this preconditioning and we concluded that we could develop this new method and so we worked on it for about a year before we told anybody in the world okay. that we were doing this. Yeah. And we, it has been fantastic. And essentially what the method is, is um, we come in with an uppercut. Okay. So you're under, you're under paste, you know, a cemented backfill. Um, and you, we drill these vertical holes. And this is going to sound very simple, but um, I can tell you that technology has advanced to allow this to happen. You couldn't have done this 15 years ago. It was enabling technology. The, to, yeah, uh, but mostly, mostly detonating technology, okay. the, yeah. the, 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 the ability to control the detonation and know that everything is blasted. So we've, we drill these holes that are about 25 feet. Um, we blast it. We have th- the material come into the swell. Okay, okay. And so now what we're doing is mucking from the top down. So we muck out that previous opening. Then we fill it. We come in and we muck underneath that. Okay. We fill it and then we muck, muck again. So similar to a long hole, except you're mining from the top, top down. You have no undercut. So that's why we call it underhand closed bench method of okay. mining. So, so you're always under a constructed back. And you always have an element of rubbleized material below your okay, feet. Okay, yeah. 
So even when you get to the very bottom cut, we, we've, we've blasted enough material below that to keep it safe. So it's, it is a remarkable method. And, you know, I, what I'm telling people is what we are able to do now is basically control um, where and when an earthquake happens. Okay. You know, effectively, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yep. And so, so when we do that blast, about a millisecond later, that rock closes about a foot. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, the material swells up. And it, and it closes immediately. And so it is now completely de-stressed. Miners are able to go in there and, you know, to muck it. We are patenting the method. Okay. Um, not that it's going to have a lot of applications because you got to have. It's specific to, yeah. Yeah, but we're, gonna, we're patenting it and we'll see, we'll see where it takes us. DMA Filtration is the ideal partner in solid liquid separation. Headquarter and manufacturing facilities in Italy with over 6,000 installations all over the world. DMA Filtration takes you beyond the boundaries of innovation thanks to the wide range of filter press models and thickeners available within the product portfolio. The launch of Domino, the largest filter press in the world, and AIDA, the system tutor providing real-time connection with the company, are only the latest achievements for this group, which is committed to continuous improvement. You can visit them at dmfiltration.com to learn more. The metals and mining industry bears a significant responsibility for meeting the dual challenge of growing demand for resources and rising standards of living from an increasing global population, while also addressing the sustainability goals of the future. Aspen Technology is here to partner with industry leaders and help them achieve those objectives with solutions in areas of advanced process controls and asset performance management that utilize artificial intelligence and machine learning to optimize their mining operations for both profitability and environmental responsibility. With Aspen Tech, you'll not only reduce downtime and improve safety, but also minimize waste, lower emissions, and improve operational efficiencies. Their expert team is always available to provide support and guidance, ensuring that you reach your operational and sustainability goals. Aspen Tech, empowering the metals and mining industry to meet the dual challenge. Learn more at AspenTech.com. PowerZone carries a massive inventory of pumps, engines, generators, and compressors. However, they don't stop there. They combine imagination with world-class engineering. They detail the entire process to every customer. Their pump package testing facility ensures your equipment is landing on-site, ready to work. That is PowerZone. Start with inventory, develop with imagination, deliver with integrity, and it's all at PowerZone.com. That is PowerZone. So when it, uh, of course, when you blast it and it swells, it also fills the opening b below, like there's no, there's well, no open. Yeah, no, I mean, but it's rebelized. Yeah. So that's the interesting thing is when you come in, there's very little... Um, blasting that additional blasting okay. that you need to do because it is the material is actually when quite. When you say rubble, yeah, okay, I get it. It's, the, your fragmentation the, is uh, is yeah. adequate to be able to muck it and and haul it okay. and, and send it up. You know, so it is. So you're using the stress to your advantage it, instead of fighting it. That's then. exactly right. Yeah. So so we we're looking at this. I you know it's it is clearly a much better method of mining for us. It's safer, safer more productive. Yeah. So we're going from, you know, we were at 800 tons a day is what this mine operated at. Yeah. And we, this past year, we were right at um, 1,000 tons. This year, we should be at around 1,100 tons. Next year, we should be probably at 1,200. And we're, we're on, the, on the silver shaft, yeah. which you might, you know, recall, it's, which is our shaft from surface that goes down a mile. Um, we're putting it, we're finally putting in the service hoist. Uh, okay. Okay. You know, it's something I've wanted to do for a decade, and it's finally happening. The 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 I've got to tell you a story because because the first shaft, when when we were up sinking, uh, uh, Lack, which became Williams, uh, the the silver shaft was done just before that, and we had a whole crew. Jay and his crew came up from the silver shaft, and Jim Tucker and a few other Paul Pendleton came up from that project and we, so that crew we call Jay and the Americans. Anyway, I digress, but uh, you might remember the old group, Jay and the American Music Group. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> so, so what we're doing is we're putting in that service hoist in order to increase the throughput of the mine. So theoretically, yeah. you could maybe conceivably go to 1,600 tons a day. Don't think we'll ever get yeah. there, but that is the theoretical limit. We, um, 
we, we are now disconnecting the mine and the mill. You might recall that the way this, because the mill had so much more capacity yeah. than the mine, yeah. it, it we, we, we didn't have any place where we were stockpiling. We were building a bunker as, as well. So we, we now have just fundamentally changed the Lucky Friday. Yeah. And, you know, so for the next 20 or 30 years, you know, we've got a, we've got a great one way. We've got other new issues that we'll have as we go deeper dealing with heat and, yeah. and you know, the ventilation requirements. But, but as far as the seismicity, we really think we have this, um, this settled for at least some period of time. Yeah. And uh, and I mentioned to you before before the show started about my my visits up there, and it's such a beautiful part of the world. And I think it's a I shouldn't say a well kept secret because there's some beautiful resorts and there's a tourist sure. industry there. But uh, for anyone that hasn't been up there before, you go up and it's just be, it's the we talked about that the center of the universe. That's exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> Wallace, Idaho. They they have. Right in the middle of uh, downtown, they say this is the center of the universe. Yeah. Nobody else has claimed it, so they, they, they claimed it a long time ago. And it's historic. My, there, there's so much interesting there. Well, and that's where Hecla, of course, started. Yeah. It was right there in Wallace, Idaho, 132 years, yeah. and we're, we're still there. Yeah. So we'll move on because there, there's lots of things you guys are into. And I'm just going to, I want to touch on the operations first before, sure. because there's, there was a list of exploration there. We we don't have time to go through all that, but but uh, and we talked about the Yukon, and sure. you're up there now at Keno Hill. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Keno Hill Mining District. Uh, it's you know, probably the second largest silver mining district after the yeah. Cobalt District in in Canada. Um, it's something we've been interested in for a long time. In 2007, we approached the company Alexco to try to you know en enter into some arrangement with them. They went a different direction, and they, they did a streaming transaction in order to move the mine forward. And we just found that that streaming transaction was problematic to operate the, the mine. And ultimately, so did Alexco as well as Wheaton. And so when the, uh, when the opportunity came to acquire Alexco, we at the same time took the, the stream out. We purchased okay, the stream. Yep. And so there's now no longer any stream at all on this um, land package. It's 88 square miles. It's a 200 million ounce district. W you know, the largest um, uh, ore body produced right at 100 million ounces. And we're having extraordinary, well, our predecessor, Alexco, had extraordinary success exploration wise. They really cracked the code. And we're now following up on that. And we've had just great exploration results and, and you know, operationally. Things are advancing. We've 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 been working at it between us and Alexco for a year of just development, just setting the mine up, and we'll start production in the second half of the year. And we would expect in the first year for it to produce two and a half million ounces, wow. and probably yeah. moving to sort of four or five million the following year. And and it will make Hecla the largest silver producer in Canada. And we'll end up producing maybe 40% of all the silver mined in Canada. Um, and that's on top of the 45% that we do in the U.S. So, yeah. Raid is a lovely thing. Eh? Yeah, it is. It <laughs> is. You know, I, I, I'm not sure if it's the highest grade silver deposit in the world, but if it's not, it's, it's close to it. Because when, when I heard that you guys were up in Keno, I thought that was a great combination because it's high grade, but it's challenging. But you guys are innovative. The, and you have the resources and, and the people, and uh, so I think it's a, a yeah. No, it's, it's a, another beautiful area. <laughs> it is. It is a beautiful, beautiful place in the the Yukon, and and you know, it just has such a rich history, and there's a lot of local support for for the the mine, and yeah. you know, support in Whitehorse. So we're we're going through. I've been to Keno Hill. I've been to Lucky Friday. I've been to Alaska, but I haven't been to Greens Creek. Oh, you missed out, man. You missed out. You're going to have to, you're going to have to fix that. So Greens Creek is, you know, a mine that we have owned a portion of since 1987. And in 2008, we, we acquired the portion that Rio Tinto owned and became the operator the of the mine. Owner and operator. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it has been a fantastic mine um, for the past, uh, you know, certainly since 1997. It has been a free cash flow generating mine every year since that time and has generated about two, a little over two billion of free cash flow. Wow. So it has been the, the really the, the, 
bedrock of Hecla since 2008. Uh, and the guys there have done a tremendous job. When we, are, when we started operating, it was a little under 1,900 tons a day. This year, we should get, by the end of the year, to 2,600 tons a day. Really? Yeah, so again, it's this, this sort of innovation. Yeah. It's innovation in the mill where it can, can you know, take that material and it's innovation in the, in the mine. And it's, you know, at this point, it's almost all cut and fill. So it's a lot of hard work, yep. you know, and a lot of coordination in order to, to get the uh, get the ore. But again, very high grade. It is the United States largest silver mine. Um, 10 million ounces of silver, roughly eight to 10 would be sort of the range that it would produce. And, uh, you know, I'm, I we just had a geo summit the other day and I cannot be more excited about the exploration potential um, at, at Greens Creek. So it it's I, my expectation is that we'll we've got another 10 15 years of, of mine life in reserves that's that's what we've had since it started yeah um, my expectation is that and another, you're still drilling and yeah, adding yeah, yeah. I, that's my, that's my expectation yeah there. well we're we're making the circuit now and we're so we're coming we're in Montreal yep so we're in La Belle Provence, so Casa Berardi. Casa Berardi's been a great mine for us. We acquired it in 2013, um, and it, at that point, it was simply an underground mine and relatively high grade. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, they had this 113 zone, and we're, we're trying, we've been exploring, trying to find another one so far we, without success, but it's, we've got 37 kilometers of strike to, to explore on. Um, it's a it's a mine that's in transition. So we went from simply underground to where now we are both underground and surface. And soon, in the next two or three years, we'll be only surface mining. And so there's a bit of investment that we have to do to uh, to get us uh, to where we need to in terms of the in terms of the cost structure of the mine. And uh, and when we do that, it will be simply an open pit mine unless we have success underground. Yeah. And uh, it generates a significant amount more cash flow than any other mine in those those years. So I I, I look at the company and I, I I find this interesting because it seems like a very balanced mix of uh, flagship operations, acquisitions, and exploration, an exploration of both your own properties and I looked on your website. There's a whole list yes, of uh, yep. exploration plays too. So. Uh, Keeps you busy. It it does, <laughs> and you know, and I, I look. I'm a big believer that you need to have a deep inventory of projects yeah. because what 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 I've learned in the in the time I've been in the industry is that you learn as you have the opportunity, as you have time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so if you think about the our operating assets, they're all big land positions. They're all long lived assets. They're all relatively low cost. And and you have time to figure out how to make how, the geology. You have yeah. time to figure out how to improve the operation. Yeah. And you and so you can in, innovate. You know, and if you have a future in front of you, you got a reason to go out and spend the time time innovating. And the same thing applies to the exploration property. So if you look at each of them, they are very large land packages, and we'll we'll work on them one year, and maybe the next year. You know, we we've got some projects where we worked on, and we. What we thought wasn't what we found. And rather than just continuing to spend or to sell the asset, it's, no, we're going to take a step back. We're going to rethink what it is we have there and give it another go in a, a future date. I was about to say triage, but that's not a good uh, no. prioritization is probably the yeah, better word. Yeah, yeah, uh, but and, and it's And it's learning, right? It's, yeah. you know, it's all about learning and innovation and, and you know, uh, being thoughtful about what you're doing and, and realize that it's it's not what you assume is there is not necessarily what's what's there yeah. right we you know the mining industry you got you you have very little knowledge and you got to make some big assumptions and oftentimes there's wrong and you need time to try to recorrect or you know try to correct and try to try to find where uh, where what's really happening so I've, I've got a leadership, I've got a leader here, I've got a leadership question for you about innovation. And and I, I picture you handing a license to innovate to your people, like a physical, like a driver's <laughs> license or something. But there, there's a leadership part in this because uh, 
uh, Heckler could very, very easily coast on its properties and on its operations, but it continues to innovate, and that's got to be uh, fostered from the top. And and well, look, I'll start. I'll, I'll say I've been very fortunate with our board. So I, in the twenty plus years I've been at Heckler, we've had in excess of twenty different directors, and you know the 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 consistent thing with these directors in general has been you need to to innovate you need to um take risk you need to allow yourself to fail um you know you you might look at our continuous miner as oh that's a failure man i look at it as huge success um yeah, you know, it, it was a stepping stone too that's exactly right yeah. that's exactly right so um and i you know the board has that view i you know, I, a lot of the innovation, the things that we attempt, I say, this is like exploration. We go and we spend a lot of money mm -hmm. exploring, and most of it is unsuccessful. Yeah. But in all of it, you learn, and you're now in a different place to be able to do something more. So, yeah. so uh, on a totally different track now, because you, you brought up the board. So sure. Uh, I'm because I'm on a couple boards and, and we see more pressure from shareholder groups with regard to ESG. And, uh, you know, it's top of mind for, for all of us these days. And of course, Hecla is a very well-established company, but you've got a number of exploration pay, plays in interesting areas. So that's got to be another area that you're, you're working hard at. Yeah, we are. And we, we always have, right? I mean, the, <laughs> The thing that's interesting about mining operations and certainly Hecla's is uh, they go into a community and what ends up happening is the community adopts the yeah. adopts the project, yeah. adopts the mine. It, they view it as much theirs as, as it is ours, yeah. right? And, and so, you know, in my experience, we've not ever had any conflict with the local local people. Now, yeah. what I will tell you is that there's conflicts that happen from people that are way far away yeah, yeah. <laughs> that decide they want to protect the local people who are, are right right yeah who are a family yeah that's exactly right so you know in all of our places we're the largest private employer um, we certainly have the the best paying jobs in in all of these places you know uh, you know our, our guys and gals they have you know a great wage and and great um, health care benefits and they have in the case of the U.S. employees, they they have a traditional pension plan, yeah. you know. So they've got lots of things that most people don't don't have, and they really appreciate that. And then and then there, are, you know, the people that work at these mines, they are leaders in the or in the in the community. And they're, uh, you know, I I know from visiting, and a lot of places are like this, but they're they're very proud to be in the industry. And sometimes people outside the industry right. don't understand that, but. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember going up there and there's a lot of pride that, you know, we work for right. ACLA and we're at Lucky Friday and look at how deep it is and, and, uh, how safe our operation is. So, uh, uh, so it's, so you guys are obviously doing something right. Eh? Well, I think, I think we are. And, you know, and you look at our different projects, we have the one that, that I guess I would mention that sort of falls into the exploration development is our projects that are in Montana. Mm -hmm. And, um, these projects are about 50 miles as the crow flies from the Lucky Friday. Oh, really? That yeah, close? They're that close, yeah. It's it's a little hard to get there it's from there. Right, but <laughs> Yeah, because I don't know the area that well to visualize it. Yeah, but, it, yeah. but, but um, you know, these are, um, th this project makes it the largest undeveloped, third largest undeveloped copper asset oh, okay. in the United States, yeah. as well as silver. So it's about 3 billion pounds of copper and about 300 and 60 million ounces of silver. So what is it a copper mine or is it a silver mine? Well, it's both. Yeah. It's both. You know, it's pr from our perspective it's a silver mine, yeah. but but it's both. We like by, you know, um, um, to have multi metals. Yeah. Yeah. We th we think that uh, you know, is makes a much more economic um, ore body. But in any case, we um, uh, are working towards towards that. We would anticipate um, that we could get permits in the next couple of years just to explore. We've okay. sort of taken a step back and said, okay, what we all we want to do is go in and do uh, do the d development so that we can explore. We're not asking for permission to mine. So yeah. we're going to do it in a two-step process. But the I guess the interesting thing I want to mention, Roy, is that 
my perception of the U.S. politics is unlike any place we've been in the last 30 years. I, I was chairman of the National Mining Association for three years. Uh, my term ended about three years ago. Okay. And, and I can just tell you that the, that the world has changed. There's a recognition in the United States um, for nationals that mining the minerals is important for national security. Yeah. It's important for economic security. It's important for the just shortening the supply chain. And then finally, there's a recognition of this energy transition and yeah. the need for the, for the metals. So the very first bill out of the House was H.R. 1, which is a permitting reform bill. Oh, okay. So, so it is a whole different world, and you do have Democrats in the Senate that are s supportive of permitting reform. So my what I'm anticipating is the course of the next two, four, six years that you will see significant permitting reform. Could be this year, but certainly over that period of time. Yeah. And that gives me more confidence with respect to these it's projects the that, future, sure. that we have in the, in the United States. And I think the same thing's happening in Canada. So I want to go back to Montana because you, sure. you, you had a qualifier in there as the crow flies. So um, it, you said it was 50 miles? Yeah, so but, due north. Yeah. But how, how, how far to actually get there if you're not a crow? <laughs> well, I mean, if you're coming from Coeur d'Alene, it's about a two-hour drive. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not very far. And you're, you're close to, you know, some, some city. You're close to Troy, Montana. Um, so would that be feed for Lucky Friday eventually? Or no, too no, far? no, no. It's, and it's, it's a whole different process. And, okay, you know, okay. You know, you're going you're gonna to flow to Copper Con there. Yeah. I, I just want to ask you if there's anything else you want to add to our discussion. You know, I guess the, the, the last thing I would add is that despite Hecla being 132 years old, we are actually the fastest growing silver miner, you know, established mines in the world. And, and it's just really remarkable. And I think it's a, a testament to um, this culture we have of innovation because it really comes down to that, right? It comes down to the Lucky Friday having the new, new method, it comes down to CASA being successful at automation that we have done, done there, it comes down to all the other things that, that we've, we've talked about. And, and, and then we're very focused. We recognize the importance of silver in the energy transition. So we're very focused on how do we continue to grow our silver production and provide the silver that the world needs. You know, that energy transition is going to be very much focused on solar energy. Yep. And for every gigawatt of solar energy you install, you need half a million ounces of silver. <laughs> and so you think about the aspirations that we have. It's call it 20, 25 percent of all the power coming from solar. That's a lot of silver that you got to have. That's a the silver market's about a billion two ounce market. We're we're now we had a growth over the prior year of twenty eight percent more silver used for solar, and I that's I'm not going to suggest it'll continue to grow at that rate, but it's going to be double digit sort of rate rate of growth. So we think we're this focus that we have on silver. You know, we've been doing it for yeah. 132 years. We think this is the time for silver, unlike any other time. Wow. And you know what? I didn't realize that. You hear so much about the about critical minerals right. and other minerals, and I, I didn't realize. Silver should be mentioned with silver. it. Yeah. yeah. Should be. I, I say all minerals are critical. I, 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 agree, I agree with I you. I try to tell people that. Well, thank you. For, and, you know, personally, I'm going to take from this. doesn't matter how old you are. You can still innovate. So, so I'm inspired. But, uh, Phil, thanks. Thanks for joining us, and uh, and once again, thanks for all that you and Hecla do to support CIM, and uh, thank you to our audience for joining us for another great installment of Mining Now. Appreciate it, Roy. Really.